Now we have enough background to calculate the black body spectrum using classical physics. We will find that it produces nonsense. The popular phrase for this problem is the ultraviolet catastrophe. What is the electromagnetic field in the black body cavity? We will answer the question by breaking it down into smaller parts. Remember that the total field can be taken as the sum of all pure sine and cosine modes. That follows from Fourier's theorem, which is a mathematical fact and doesn't depend on physics. Fourier's theorem allows us to focus on how each sine and cosine behaves. The first physics trick is to consider an imaginary cube in the cavity with sides of length L. This is the perfect mathematical cube as opposed to the real cube described by many authors. A real cube would have rough sides and interact differently at low and high frequencies of light. For instance, radio waves would go right through the walls, while X-rays would ionize a real cube. So, this is a mathematical cube, and you'll see that's all that's necessary for the logic to work. Let's show the electric and magnetic fields in red and blue. To simplify things, we rotate to two dimensions and concentrate on the electric field. The magnetic field will just show as a blue line because it's perpendicular to the electric field. Now invoke thermodynamics. In thermal equilibrium, the cube can't be transporting energy to the right because that would cause the bright wall to heat up. That would allow perpetual motion machines to be built. Similarly, the field can't flow energy to the left. The only possibility is for the field to be made of equal amounts of left and right going waves, which is equivalent to saying standing waves. Standing waves occur when the box size is an integral multiple of half the wavelength. We can express this relationship in terms of wavelength, meters per wave, but later we will find it more convenient to work in terms of wave number, which is the number of waves per meter. We can further simplify our logic by changing our measure of length from meters to twice the cube size. Then the wave numbers become simple integers, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. This plot is showing four waves per 2L, which is wave number 4. The next animation shows wave numbers 1 to 6. Besides the standing wave pattern, you can see that the higher wave numbers go up and down quicker. That behavior is predicted by Maxwell's equations. There's a fixed relationship between frequency and wave number. Max Planck knew this relationship from Maxwell's theory. Later, Einstein recognized it as a fundamental principle of the universe and the basis for the special theory of relativity. Another advantage of wave numbers is that they let us easily work in three dimensions. There's a wave number for the x-direction, the y-direction, and the z-direction. So far, we have only been showing the x-direction, but all three wave numbers can be plotted on a graph like this. The three wave numbers form what is called the wave vector. You can think of the wave vector as pointing from the origin to a point on the three-dimensional plot. The wave vectors could be anywhere on the plot except for the thermal equilibrium condition. As we have seen, thermal equilibrium limits the wave numbers to integers. This can be shown graphically by putting a little red dot at the allowed values for the wave numbers. The plot shows the first 100 allowed values for the wave vector. With real blackbody radiation cavities, the number of dots goes into the trillions. Next, remember the relationship between wave number and frequency in three dimensions. This equation means that once we select a point on the wave number plot, we are also specifying its frequency. That's important because our objective is to figure out how many modes of the field exist as a function of frequency. So frequency is the length of the wave vector that points from the origin to the dot in wave number space with a scale factor of the speed of light. All points that are equidistant from the origin will have the same frequency. From geometry, we know that all points equidistant from the origin form a sphere. All points on the surface of the sphere have the same frequency. 
In fact, we don't just want the surface, but a tiny little layer resting on the surface. The question is, how many combinations of kx, ky, and kz are in a tiny layer resting on the sphere? This would be a hard question to answer if the wave numbers were small. But for real blackbody radiation, they're in the trillions. That allows us to approximate the answer by the volume of the tiny layer resting on the sphere. Remember your high school math class where you derive the surface area of a ball for pi r squared. What we want is the volume of a tiny shell of depth dr resting on the surface of the ball. It'll be 4 pi r squared times dr. In our case, r is equal to 2l over c times the frequency. Also, we need only 1 eighth of the sphere because the wave numbers must be positive. And finally, for each red dot, there are two modes of polarization. Putting it all together, the number of modes at a particular frequency is given by this formula. Lord Rayleigh first derived this formula in the 1800s. Its derivation is the hardest math we will have to do. Remember the physics assumptions that were used to get the formula. First, thermal physics was used to show that the cube can't be transferring energy from one side to the other. That limits us to standing waves and sets the possible wave numbers. And second, Maxwell's electromagnetic theory was used to get the frequency once the wave numbers were known. Now that we have the number of modes at any frequency interval, the rest of the calculation is simple. The first step is to use Boltzmann's equipartition theorem, which says that the energy per degree of freedom is 1 half kT. The theorem applies to any degree of freedom that has an energy proportional to the square of its generalized coordinates. In an electrodynamics course, you learned that you could use the electric and magnetic fields for generalized coordinates. The energy is e squared plus b squared. The question is, how many degrees of freedom does the electromagnetic field have? You'd think there would be six degrees of freedom, three for the E field and three for the B field. The complication is that the E and B fields are not independent. They are constrained by Maxwell's equations, which reduces the number of degrees of freedom from six to two. We were left with the energy per mode of the field is simply kT. Recall the formula for the number of modes as a function of frequency. To get to our goal, just multiply by kT, and we get the classical formula for the black body energy as a function of frequency. It looks like just another formula until you visualize the consequences. Here's a graph of the formula laid on top of the black body experimental data. There's a big mistake. The energy soars to infinity. At high frequency, it just keeps rising and never comes back to zero. The popular phrase for this is the ultraviolet catastrophe, but I like a more mundane explanation. The classical formula says that an infinite amount of energy is needed to heat up an enclosed space. In other words, you can never bake bread in an oven. Of course, that's crazy. There must be a mistake in the logic. But where? Physicists have learned to love problems like this because they often point the way to new physics. The resolution to this problem turned out to be world-shaking. Watch the next video to see how it was done.